Okay, so what is an engineer and what do they do? Well, an engineer by definition is somebody who invents, designs, analyzes, and builds. And typically in profession, an engineer will do two, three, maybe all four of these tasks. So as an engineer, you need to really be able to apply yourself to all these things. So what do they do in practice? Well, I like to think of it in three distinct categories. There's inventive. This is when you take existing systems and construct something new. So let's say you take some motors and throw them on a leg for a robot. If you're the first one that's setting up this design, that's what I like to think of as inventive. Then there's R&D. This is working in a lab and you're figuring out new designs for materials, right? So you're looking in microscopes and checking out the new structure of some piece of rock or whatever, and you're actually checking it out, um, applying material science procedures and methods to construct new materials or to modify them uh, to get something really new. This is like if you think back to when they did clay pots for the first time. This is not putting things together like a leg on a robot where you have the motor set up as it is. Instead, it's developing new materials like they did with clay or constructing carbon fiber, things like that. So that's a second category I think of. Then there's engineering trade. And this is maybe what you think of most when you do engineering. Often this is the most common sort of engineering position. And this is basically where you take the tools and calculations to generate designs and specific equipment or something like that. So let's say um, if you're at like a civil engineering company that's designing equipment to handle water treatment, for example, you'll be constructing certain things or designing certain things like clarifiers to treat the water. And you'll be using calculations, you'll be using tests to figure out what sort of sizing you need for this. You'll figure out what exactly you want it to do or how you actually want to design this, um, all that sort of stuff. And that's using existing tools, maybe use tools like STAD, and maybe your company has like some existing uh, systems to calculate for this specific design of equipment. If you're having this much flow, then you have some inputs and then you have your program that generates some outputs, right? And this output may be the dimensions of this piece of equipment. Maybe it's the full 3D model, whatever it is, uh, that would be like the engineering trade where it's sort of you're learning from others uh, that have developed skills and it's similar to a like trade school where you learn brick masonry. Um, you really just apply knowledge from other people and, and use existing tools like STAD and things to apply that. So those are what the main things we think of doing when we're in engineering are going to be. So based on this, what might we want to know programming for? Because it seems like this is pretty straightforward. We're inventing, designing, analyzing, building. But there's actually a lot you can do with programming. And let's look at a few examples. So if you are trying to do some engineering, uh, how might you use programming? You might want to quickly set up new calculations. So this is pretty straightforward, but you may need to set up tons of calculations. And this is something we would be familiar with as engineers. I mean, you have to compute the hypotenuse of some triangle. You need to figure out some of the forces in the x direction. That's all calculations, and we can use programs to perform 
calculations for us because that's really all programs are gonna do. So this is what use programs for. So quickly set it up new calculations, pretty straightforward. Um, and this is something we really in particular want to look for when we're deciding what approach we want to program in. If we want to go like a Python route, if we want to go MATLAB C, uh, these are going to be some of the things we'll look at to decide because we're thinking what we really care about. And being able to quickly set up new calculations is near the top of the list often. Uh, another is have access to read collected data and information. So this is something very often we have to deal with a ton of different points of data. And we want to be able to handle all of it quickly and easily. But first to do that, we want to be able to access that information. So very important to us. Uh, next, performing easy operations on lots of data. So we talked about being able to quickly set up new calculations, but we also want it to be pretty straightforward. We don't want to be have a, have a very complex uh, setup in order to perform basic operations on tons of data. Um, we want to be able to, for example, just do arithmetic on our data. If we, uh, let's say we have a sensor and it's got some scaling, we need to be able to scale it between two points. You can do that by, by using the input and scaling it divided by the old scaling, multiplying it by new scaling. And that'll give you your actual temperature or value corresponding with some electronic measurement on your device. Um, so that's very important when we're dealing with data that we're able to do that, right? Uh, you can also, in computation, want to do things like your calculus. So you want to be able to differentiate. You want to be able to integrate all that stuff to be able to work with your data. And then things like statistical things. So figuring out the maximum and minimum of your data, figuring out averages, things like that can be really informative. And you'll have to work with that as an engineer a lot to either in one of these steps, maybe it helps you in analyzing the design, maybe you're using it to uh, to build. You're figuring out uh, how close with statistical measurements uh, your designs are successfully being built. Maybe they're not being built right, and you need to figure out how often they're not being built right and how to improve that. Uh, you'll want to be able to, with programming, do many repeated operations. So that's just pretty straightforward for or like if we have to run a hundred different computations, we don't want to have to write out each time to solve some equation or to do some statistical measurement. We want to be able to have the program do something over and over again, maybe go through all the values in some list of data we've got and be able to do something each time we find one that meets that specification. Then there's, we want to be able to generate outputs. So often this is returning stuff to files or printing it out, whatever, so that we can actually get the results of our calculations. This is going to be very important for us. And depending on your exact setup, what you're doing with your company, you, you may have different things for how you generate outputs. Maybe you're generating images, maybe you're just doing a calculation and you're saving that to some file. Whatever it is, that's going to be very important when you're deciding how and what you're programming. Maybe you want to visualize the data. So that's a way to generate output. Maybe you want to get a file. All those are options. And then, of course, data analysis and numerical processing. So these are all basic things we're going to possibly want to do with our program. So we want to sort of figure out how to do these, as well as figuring out why, why would we pick Python or C or 
MATLAB, it's really because we're really caring about this specific aspect of it. And maybe uh, for performing easy operations on lots of data, maybe Python's the best route for that. Maybe MATLAB uh, to do many repeated operations. If we're really caring about speed, maybe we need to go C++. If we're caring about generating outputs, probably all of them are fine. Um, but maybe it's a lot easier in MATLAB to visualize your data. So it really depends on the specific aspects you're caring about, but these are the sorts of things we're probably gonna want to do with programming. So some other nice things, nice to haves. Uh, these are things that may or may not be important, but uh, you may wanna think about for your programming. Uh, the first thing is you may wanna set up an environment where non-programmers can use the system. So this just means like if you, if you have it where the program can only be used by somebody who has Python installed on their computer and they know how to get to the output file or whatever, uh, then that limits the number of people that can use it. But if you can set up an environment where it's just like a program that they install, just like Firefox or a game you can install on your computer, then that opens the capability either for internal to your company, or maybe you want to sell this or just let other people use it. Then setting up an environment like a GUI or a graphical user interface can make it so that your, your tool is a lot more useful. Uh, maybe you want to control hardware. So this is like if you're making a robot, it's very important that your programming language actually be able to carry over into controlling the robot. If you can do all the computations, but you can't control the hardware, that isn't going to do much good, right? Maybe you want to automate repeated computer operations. So maybe with the program you're using, uh, you always have to use a specific number of key presses or mouse presses in order to do something you want. And this is a very repeated process. Then you can use things like macros to do that. Um, so if you need to have some sort of computations based upon what's on your screen, for example, to look at what's happening on your screen and do something as a result, very important that you can control the computer uh, from your programming. Another is integrating and work with other programs. So this may be if you're like a simulations guy and you're using a 3D environment that uh, constructs 3D models, then maybe you want to figure out the programming language that actually works well with that software. So you really want to figure out, for example, if you're using like Blender for some 3D visualizations, uh, Python can be very useful to generate scripts and things to produce new models, to automate tasks, to put a lot of things together. Uh, and Python would probably be the way to go. So these are what we're really going to kind of be thinking about when we're working in programming, because we want to just have things that are actually useful tools. It's nice if you have a, a whip, but if you need a wrench, a whip isn't the most useful tool. So we really want to think when we're getting this new tool, how can we actually use this? What is the application of this? And these are the main things that I found useful myself. So let's think uh, even more about some specific applications of of these. So a few examples. One would be generating a product proposal document based upon some inputs of parameters for your design. This is a very common task if you're working in industry and when you actually go through with the cell, you can have contract documents that define exactly what you're providing, what you your job is and what's going to be included. And maybe you can automate the production of those files. 
that could save you a ton of time. Another example, generate a new 3D model based upon design parameters. So like I mentioned a little bit before, a lot of companies have specific equipment and they have design programs that just you feed in like the parameters for the design. So like it needs to be able to handle this much weight. It needs to be able to handle this much uh, mass flow. And then it generates the actual design parameters, the sizing of it, the materials, all that sort of stuff for what is necessary to actually meet those specifications. Then there's maybe you want to extrapolate from existing data to predict future results. Very common thing you may have to do. Another simulate physical phenomena. This may be things like CFD or computational fluid dynamics. And this is something where a, a lot of times programming can be integrated with existing systems like ANSYS. And you really have to be able to know how to uh, set up the environment and everything to do it with programming. Another control robotic systems based upon sensor data and roll signals. So something like a quadcopter, right? This is something where you just use sensor data and directions basically from a controller and you decide how the actuators actually run the system to make the quadcopter go how you want. So all of these are why you could actually, you as a mechanical engineer or some or physical engineer, uh, we're not software engineers necessarily, but to actually apply programming to real world systems because engineers really are just applied scientists. So we either invent, we do research and des develop, or we apply existing uh, understanding of equipment and processes to invent, design, analyze, and build. So this is what you can sort of think about when you're doing programming in how you can actually use it yourself. All right, so with all that, what is Python? So Python is a scripting language that, well, if we look at the python.org slash docs slash essays blurb, you can see what is Python? Python is an interpreted object-oriented, high-level programming language with dynamic semantics. It's high-level built-in data structures, allows dynamic typing and dynamic binding. Uh, it's used for rapid application development and so on. So what does this mean? It's interpreted. This means it doesn't all build into a single program. So with something like C, you take the compiler, So C would be program. You put it into a compiler and then you get the executable. So you don't run the code like line by line here or anything. You take the entire program, put it into the compiler and then you get the executable. With a interpreted language, you have the program and it sort of runs it as it reads through it itself. So it doesn't immediately compile it all into one final executable. It has a program that actually looks at what you made, the code you wrote in your program, and it goes through and executes all of it itself. So that's what it means interpreted. It's just taking the program and running it with the interpreter instead of a compiler putting it all into executable. And then high level just means it isn't as close to the machine code. So you don't have to think about how the machine is handling everything as much. It's more oriented towards how we want to think about it. So often for engineering, that's very useful because it makes it so that we don't have to think about what the computer is doing in the background. We just think about what we actually want to accomplish with it. 
And yeah, because it's object oriented, that basically means that it has classes and things that let us create sort of objects in our program. And this is how everything interacts with each other is in these objects. Instead of something like C is a procedural programming language where it's meant to sort of have a procedure or a, a routine or subroutine that has like a list of the actions that you take. But there's also like functional programming. There's a lot of different programming paradigms, but that's what Python is, is this object oriented one. So that's sort of an introduction to Python. Uh, you can go to python.org to get the information on actually installing Python. You can just go to downloads and pick your platform. There's also lots of other ways to install Python. I'd look into Anaconda is a great way, but there are tons of different ways. So. Okay, so we'll look at starting programming in Python, and then we'll kind of look at, once we've gone over the basics, how can we use this tool to accomplish some of our goals? So we'll look at specifically applying it to problems. So first, let's just kind of introduce, if, you, if you're in Windows and you're doing Python, the introduction way of doing it is just go to idle, and you can run that this will open the idle shell and this is just the version of python you're using right here so you can ignore that but i'll just do file new file and then this is where your actual code is right so in this untitled is where you can type anything in save this file run it and that's where the actual python happens in this idle shell you can type in whatever code you want to run right here. And to use the shell, you just type a single line of code here, and then you press enter, and that will run just that one line. Uh, you can also do some additional stuff like get help, um, check copyrights, uh, some things like that just built into this idle shell. But in this, we're going to look at just starting creating some basic programs. So to create it and run it, we just save this as and I'll save it in my folder. Save it wherever you like. And this will be that like one. Now in this, when I want to run it, I can just specify run module. It will then pop this into the shell. So the shell is where it'll actually output what's happening from this program. So right now, nothing's happening, of course, because we haven't set anything up. But let's say we want to create a variable. We have variable name on the left and then equals sign. This will just give us uh, the right of it. We'll update the variable name with some value inside it. So variable is just holding some bit of information, often a number. So we've got our variable. Uh, let's say we want it to have the value of 10. If I save this and run it, and you can see I've changed my key bindings because you'll probably not have control shift return here. You can do that with options, configure idle, and changing the key binds. But whatever is right here, you can use to run as well. But I'll just click run. Uh, it will not do anything, but now if I type in variable name right here, it will be 10. And this is just because I wrote variable name is 10 here. If I swap this to 11 and run it again, then now in the shell, variable name is 11. So it's very basic, uh, similar to how most programming languages work, but you just got your variable on the left with some name that you chose and then the value on the right you have to 
match. You can't do 11 equals variable name because it requires that the variable name be on the left and then the value on the right. Python is a case sensitive language. So if you said variable underscore name is 15, you can have both these variables and they're separate. You can, as you probably noticed, use an underscore. Uh, so the things you can use in variable names, you can use letters, capital letters, you can use underscores, and that's it. And if we went right here, if I said a is 15, that would work. If I did underscore a is 15, it will also work. So in Python, you can use letters, numbers, and underscores. And you can start with a letter or an underscore. Uh, but if you tried to start with a number, it'll give you an error uh, just saying syntax error, invalid syntax. So that's just saying that the variable cannot start with a number. And so if I did a1 is 99, then I could call it a1, be 99. But that's, that's how that works. So we can have, again, letters, capital letters, underscores, and numbers. But it must start with a letter or underscore. No, can't start with the number. Now, uh, one thing that's really useful to know anytime you learn programming is how to comment in your code. So if I tried to run this, we'll say, okay, invalid syntax. And the reason for this is because this is not a line of code. I'm just making a note here for myself to reference later, right? So n a underscore one must start with a letter or underscore. So if it's in here, uh, the program thinks it's part of its code and then it tries to run it. And this does not mean anything to the program. So it's going to say, I don't understand. So what you can do is you can say format and you can comment out region. This puts two hashes or pound signs in front. And you actually only need one because as you can see, it'll outline it in red. But this just works to comment out the code. So whatever's commented, whatever's in red like this, will be invisible to the program. It'll just ignore it. So now if I try to run this, it runs just fine now, and it doesn't pop that syntax error. If you wanted to comment out multiple lines, so like these are the lines. I want to out. So let's say I want to comment all these. You have a couple options. You can either select all of it, go to the format and comment out region. And this is just going to each of the lines you have selected and putting the pound sign in front, right? So you can do either or. It's just much quicker to select it click edit and or click format and comment out region. If you click uncomment, uncomment again, it will take it out of the comment. So it just will delete all the hashes. Now there is another way of doing this. This isn't actually what the way it was intended to be done in Python, but this is a perfectly valid way of having a comment, multi-line comment, and it just is using three quotes. And then anything until you put another three quotes is a comment. So that's pretty nice. Uh, that way you don't have to put hashes in front. Although of course you can just do commenting out uh, with that selection. So that's how that works. Um, and then we created a variable, you can make variables interact. So the way Python works is it just goes line by line and does operation after operation. So if you try to in math, say a equals one and then a equals two, that would be a problem, right? But in programming, all that happens is it starts, it says variable underscore name is 11. 
and it says capital variable underscore name is 15. Goes down here, nothing. Goes down here, it's a comment, so it ignores it. Here, it ignores it. Here, it's nothing. And then it finally gets to here, it says A equals one. Okay, so at this point, we have three variables defined, and one of them is A being one. Next, you go to this line, you say A equals two. So all that happens here is that at the end of this, a will equal two and it will be as if this is ignored, right? Because you overrode the value of what was originally in a to be two. So in Python, you don't have to give data types. You don't have to initialize variables. In some other languages, you may have to do that. In Python, it's pretty simple. Um, I can just call up a variable, whether or not I've already defined it and override it or set its first value. Uh, for operations, um, basic arithmetic, you have a couple of different things you can do. You can do uh, addition, the dash for subtraction, slash for divide, star for multiply or asterisk, right? You can also do double star for the power of. So if I did two multiplied by two, That'll be four. If I did two star star three, it would be two to the power of three, which is two times two times two, which is eight, right? So these are the main tools we've got in our basic arithmetic toolbox. So when I say a variable is equal to something, I can use these to get whatever calculation I want. And you can also use the parentheses to tell it order of operations. So normally, if I did 2 times 3 plus 11, it'll do the 2 times the 3 first, and then it'll add 11. Uh, that's how we would do it in a math class. That's also how the program will look at it. So it should be 6 plus 11, which would be 17. I'll just copy this over to here. If I call up a now, it's 17. But if I said a equals 2 times, times, and then 3 plus 11, now a is 28, right? Because initially it did the order of operations, and then it used parentheses to tell you that I want to add these two first. So very important to keep an eye on the order of operations there. And you can also use other variables to, to do operations. And it just treats it basically as if you typed in whatever its current value is. So if I typed in a plus 15, it'll just go right now. I know it is 17 from this. And so it'll do 17 right here plus 15 and that it will be able to calculate just fine. So if I run this, let's me save it. No problem. I pull up B and 15 plus 17 is 32. So it gets me exactly what I expected. So once again, you just, you have to be careful that your variables are all defined on the left side of the equal, and then you're telling it what equals on the right. So that's the basic setup and how you can use Python. So it's pretty simple. Python's pretty easy programming language and it's known for being sort of a good beginner language. And one of the reasons for that is that it's quick to pick up and to do basic calculations. So that makes it very nice for engineers when we're not necessarily focused on the program in itself. We want to apply this to something. Uh, it can make programming in Python the best option a lot of the time. So there's a few other things. This is just creating numerical variables, right? So another thing that you can create is characters or strings. And the way this works is you, again, just create a variable name. I'll just call it variable name two. And this is a string. So I'll do quote. This is a string. And this just houses instead of numbers. So right now, A and B are just number values this is a string or a set of characters and in this case what it, what happens is it's storing the actual character like when we type on our keyboard 
Uh, we have the numbers, we have the symbols, we have the letters. All of those, when you write like a text file, are stored as characters. And so we can type a numerical value as a character and it works just fine. It's just a matter of uh, if you want to be able to do arithmetic with it, you have to, the, the computer programming language has to understand that it's a number, not a string. Because if you try and add A and E together, what does that mean? Well, we can actually take a look. If we try and add A and A, what it'll do when you're adding strings together, or you can also do an apostrophe instead of the quote, and it'll do the same thing. And when you add strings together, it'll actually just put them as one string. So if you're trying to call up, or if you're trying to put two strings together, if you tried to add one and two, it'll just be one, two. It's not doing any math there, right? It's just putting the two strings together. So if you wanted to actually add two numbers together, then you have to make sure they're actually numbers. Um, and one way you can you can deal with things is so now we've got that number or we'll just call these numerical values and then we've got the strings for the characters which are the same. Um, to swap between these we can do a couple of things and here we'll start using functions now functions have three aspects. They have inputs, outputs, and a name. So to use a function with a single input of input one, single output of output one, and a name of function name, here you can see how you do that. And the important thing with these functions is, as you can see on the left, we have out equals. So it's defined just like a calculation, some operation on numerical values is. So the variable out equals and then whatever the function name that's just whatever your functions called. There's lots of built-in functions that we use that come with Python. And then you have an open parenthesis and then you have input one and maybe you just have one input. If you do then you just close it off. And this input one could be whatever data type or class you have and Right here, we just have variable input one. Whatever the value of input one is, that will go into the function uh, called function name, and that will then run. And then if you have multiple inputs, you just separate it with a comma and keep going until you have all your inputs in, and then you close it with a closing parenthesis. So if I said float of one, or float of the string one, it will return a numerical value of 1.0. And if I did int of string 1, it'll return a numerical value of 1. Now, these two pop out different things when I just show them in the shell. The reason for this is a floating is a floating point, meaning it can house values in the decimal place, right? So it's 1.0. And also, if I did this it can hold more it's just cut off the uh ending the trailing zeros there right but flow can hold a bunch of numbers past the decimal point whereas integer if i do int of one point it'll actually give us an error because if i did the exact same thing float i would get that i can also convert uh, and in the shell, you can actually call up the last command with an underscore. So if I wanted the previous command, that's an underscore two commands ago. Uh, in some cases, if you if you deal with like IPython, uh, that's a different system that, that lets you just run Python code line by line. But in shell, uh, the one you want to work with is underscore, and that's just the previous value. So I can take a float like that, get it to an int this way. So if I wanted to actually convert that string to an integer, 
if I tried to directly do it, I'll get an error. But if I did float of int or er, uh, int of float, sorry, and then the string 1.0, 0, like that, what I'm doing here is this is a built in function for Python. And it just takes in some input. In this case, it's a number or a string or whatever. And it tries to convert it to a floating point value. So just to have the decimal points. Or with int, we convert it to an integer. So it has a single input and it produces a single output. So I could set this equal to a variable and it'll just put that output of the function into that variable. So if I said int is float of one, or a is float of one, sorry, and I look at a, it'll be 1.0 because it took the output of float of one and put it into a. And it's actually making a a float. Whereas if I did b is int of one, and I look at b, it's one. Now if I try and add a and b together, it will convert it to a floating point because one of them is a floating point. So if I did 1.0, divided by 11, it will handle it just fine. And as well as if I do one divided by 11, it used to be in Python in older versions that this would, this would do an integer of one divided by integer of 11. And then it would take that into an integer. And what would happen is you would get zero because it would just round it when it got the output. So you have to be careful if you're using old versions of Python, but in the new version, you don't actually have to include the point zero to tell it it's a floating point. You can do one divided by 11, and it's smart enough to realize that you want it to be a floating point. If you didn't want it to, then of course you just do int of one divided by 11. So these are the functions, and you can feed in the outputs of functions as the inputs of other functions. So wherever I do int of one, that just, I could substitute this in with the value one, because it's just taking whatever the output is, and that's effectively putting it in right there, like pasting it over top of it. So when I try and do int of float of the string 1.0, all that, then, what I'm doing is I have this internal thing. So it, it's like math that computes what's inside the parentheses first. So first it does this, but there's nothing to compute there. So then it goes out here and it says, okay, float of this. So we know it'll get out like this. So it'll just convert this string to a numerical float value. And then that float value, it feeds into the input of the integer. So this is effectively the same as just writing this. And there we go, it works just fine, but I could do my whole process and it would do the exact same thing as you can see. So that's integers and floats. And to convert a string to a numerical, so we have int float, and then we have string and string takes in a numerical value or whatever input you're given you're giving it or sorry it's not string it's str and str is short for string and string just takes in whatever input it's like int it just takes in an input and then it converts it to a string so i can feed in that 1.0 so on, and then it'll convert that to a string. And then if I wanted to get it back, I could just float of that. And that gives me a floating point number, right? So that's how you can convert between when we create a string, when we create a float or int, we can convert between them. And you can use int and float to control which the value actually is. So if you just add one to two and you want it to be a float, then you can convert it to a float and then you want it to be a string, then you convert it to a string. And you can just do that in multiple steps, of course. So say we've got a float and then you want to convert it to a string. So now I say a string of a. So 
just updating the value a is now the function string with the input a, which will just make a, which was 1.0. So I could, could just type in 1.0 here, but I'll keep it as a. So a is string of a, it just converts a to a string. Now when I look at it, it's 1.0. So if I didn't want it to be, to have the 0, 0.0, then I could of course say is int or a is float of a, and then I could take the int of that, and a is string a. Now I took away the 0, 0.0 because I converted the string to a float, but then took the integer of that, and then I took the string of that. So this shell is really useful to give you a bunch of, of quick tests. And then when you're really writing out code that you want to like repeat or have here to remember later, because you're working through problems or whatever, you'll be able to use this. Um, and if I tried to have a string, let's say I want my bar string, I'll just say A, B, e, C, D, E, F, G. Well, if I try to actually enter in here, the way Python works is when you enter, it expects it to be done. So to actually have a enter in a string in Python, you can do that. But the way you have to do it is with this. So this is actually creating uh, a string. So it's not technically a comment like the, the hash is. The triple quote just makes a string. It just doesn't save it to a variable or anything. So it allows you to, to make a multi-line comment, but it's really just creating a string with enters in it. So to make this string include enters, I need to do three quotes and then close it off with three quotes. And then as you can see now, they're green. And that's just because it successfully converted them to a string. When it was just the single quote, you can see these are black now. And that's because these are not actually, Python's not recognizing this as a string. So you need to include this. So um, as you may have noticed, if I run this, if I were to type this into the shell, it wouldn't show anything for this, but it would for this, right? If I either don't save something to a variable or I just call up the variable, it will print it out after I send that command, right? After I enter it. With this, it will not do that. It restarted and it ran it. But even though I, I have this string here, if I just type this in, copy this, actually all this bigger but if I copy this paste it in here it'll print out this string right but it didn't in this sh uh, when I ran this code that's because in the shell it thinks that it, it's used for mostly visualizing stuff because it's not just running a script it's quickly like testing out like if you wanted to see int of 1 divided by 11 It'll just print it out because it expects that you sort of want to be able to see everything. That's what the shell is for. But with the actual code, when you run it, it's not going to work quite the same way. Um, and to actually see anything printed out, you have to use print and then you can like print point zero and that will print it out to the screen. So if I wanted to actually print my var str, then I could do print, and then the input is my var str. And again, my shortcut is control shift enter or return. So when I run that, it prints out my variable right here. Um, so that's how you actually can show things that are in your code on the shell, which makes it very useful. You, you may have also noticed when I ran this, that it didn't actually print it out with the lines. It printed it out with this slash n. And the slash n is actually short for this enter. 
So a shorthand notation, instead of having to do the three quotes, um, if I wanted my bar str2, I could recreate the one above with a slash n, b slash n, c slash n, d slash n, e slash n, f slash n, g. I need a closing parenthesis there. But if I run this, save it, run it, and then I look at my bar str, and then my bar str2, they're the same. So either way you do it, get uh, to Python looks the same. This is just if it's easier for you to, like if you had a some text that you copied over, like I just wanted to copy this um, over from like a document, and I didn't want to have to paste this in and then quote, delete, slash n, and delete, slash n, and delete slash n, uh, instead of having to do that, you can just copy it in and use the triple quote and then end with a triple quote. As you see, until I close it with the triple quote, it'll just make everything after it a string. So I got to make sure to close it off there or everything here will be thought to be a string. And if I just ran this, it'll give you an error because I didn't terminate this string. So it's just notifying me that I started a triple quote string and it didn't end it. And that's that's the main stuff. So slash n, that's a special character. Uh, you have a several special characters. Slash t is tab, slash n is new line. And those are the main ones I use. You can look up, if you look up special characters and strings in Python, you'll find more uh, if you needed to, to do other ones. So there's that. And as I said, you can fit in all sorts of stuff into strings. So you can fit all these characters. So if you wanted to, for example, actually have a slash n in a string and it not be a new line, you can do slash slash n and then, because when I print a new line, it'll just print an enter. But if I print slash slash n, it'll print slash n. So that's useful. The slash, the slash before the slash is just notifying it, like effectively neutralize this slash as a special character and just make it a normal slash. So there you go. That's how that works. You can also do things like input and with input you just give it a string so enter a variable and then it will enter it'll print that out what you entered as a string enter a variable and then you enter something one one two three four for example i enter that and then the output of this will be once it runs then whatever's here will be returned from this input function so if i created a variable bar is input of enter a variable and often you want to do a colon space so that it's not just your writing at the end here and it looks confusing if i enter that enter a variable i'll say the variable is 10. now when i look at var it's 10 but it is a string because it doesn't know if i input a number so if i wanted to do a number like for example, let's say at the end here, I want input, enter a value to add. And then I can get the second value, input, enter, add to it. Then I could print A and B, because now this, uh, it prints out all that I can actually see in the code. It it did all of this, right? It created variable name, created the second variable name, and gave it values, but it just hasn't printed anything out. And then when it finally got to here, it printed my var str. And then I said a is input, enter value to add. So if I wanted to add 5, I enter, and then I want to add it to 11. 
character. And then it'll print out 511 because it just added the two strings together. So I would convert A to a float and then add that to the float B. And now when I run it, 511, and now it's got 16. So that's a pretty nice tool. There's lots of other things we can create just as you have strings and numbers. You can create arrays or lists. Um, I can create a list, list, and when something goes purple, that means it's like a special function or something that's built in. So you don't want to say like list equals, you want to give it some other name. So I'll say var list. And I can use a bracket one, two, three, and separate it with commas and then close bracket. Now, when I run this, enter value to add five. If you run into a problem, you can do control C to exit that. So I'll control C, run over here, run it again. Five, 11, 16. And now our list is one, two, three. And you can actually see the type of a variable by typing in type, T-Y-P-E, and then the variable. And it will tell you the class or the data type of it. So this class is a list. So these are just called lists in Python. Um, they're called arrays in other, other programming languages. They're basically the same thing. But here we got a list and now I, I'm able to house a couple numbers like a, a matrix would be able to. And if I wanted to, I could add strings in here. Close that. And now I've got a list of strings. But in any case, when I add a list with another list, uh, you could think a couple of things are possible, maybe. Uh, it adds one with one, two with two, three with three. Maybe it just puts it at the end. And if we run this, we can see it actually just puts these together. So it just puts this list and then continues it with this list. Uh, so one, two, three, comma, one, two, three. And like if we wanted to do matrix math, uh, lists aren't really the way to do it because as you can see, it doesn't really, if I even did one, two, three, 11, it'll give an error because it cannot put a list with an int. But if it was three and then the list 11, then it would just put it at the end. So if I wanted to add 11 to each of these, then I could either write in here, one plus 11, two plus 11, three plus 11, and that'll get me it because it'll just put the first location in here as 12, the second is 13, and the second is 14. So there I can do lists. You can also do lists within lists. So I can make a list where the first is one, two, three. Uh, if I try to do the second one, two, three, then it can create a list of lists. So it's just got a outside list here. And then the first list has got one, two, three. Second list is one, two, three. And if I tried to call up, let's say I save this to bar list. Let me close it, of course. Bar list, you can actually look at the elements inside of a list. So if I did bar list bracket one bracket, it'll give the first element in bar list. And the first element in this list is the list, which is one, two, three. But wait, it's giving us string one, string two, and string three, which is the second element in our list here. And the reason for that is because Python actually works starting at zero. So different programming languages work different this way, but it is probably most common that it actually starts with 
zero instead of one. But so if I wanted to look at the first element in this list here, actually I have to call it zero, and that'll be the one, two, three that I was looking for. So that's how you can actually look at um, elements in my list. And if I wanted to look at specifically this element within this list, I could do var list of zero and then the zero with one in that. And then that'll give me just the one because it looks at var list, finds the first one in it, and then finds the first one in that. And that is one in this case. So that's lists. We also have dictionaries our dict and the way we can create a dictionary is with a curly brace so what a dictionary does and you can see it's a special word when uh, when we type it in it's purple so I'll do var dictionary and I'll use curly braces and the way a dictionary works is you assign some, I'll just give an example here. You give it some value or a key, and then that corresponds to something. So we can create this dictionary with a open curly brace, and then whatever key we want, colon, whatever value. And then we can add more elements with comma, and then more key colon value and then close it off with a close curly brace whenever we're finished in a dictionary you have a word and then the definition with it so this is like our word in the dictionary this is the definition of it so this can make it really easy if you want a to be uh, do this again but i make it more you probably want I may want a dictionary that's, let's call it uh, num to string. And what this does is it just converts numbers to strings. And I'll just look at one to string one, two to string two, three to string three. And as you can see, I'm just going back and forth between quote and apostrophe. You can't do apostrophe quote, but you can do quote, quote, and apostrophe, apostrophe, basically interchangeably. Um, so you just choose which one you want to use. But let's say I make this dictionary. You can call up the elements in a dictionary similar to how you can with a list, but instead of calling up the position, so this being the first position, right, I could call it up with zero. Instead of that, I call it up with its key, and then that will return its value here. So if I call up one, it will be the string one because it just converts, it looks in this dictionary, it finds what one is equal to, and then it returns that. So that's another type of a variable that you can have. You, you talk about lists, you talk about dictionaries, um, and there are others. You may find some uses for them, but these are the main ones I find useful, and these are the ones we'll start with. So that's how those work and this is sort of the foundational stuff in python right uh the next thing we'll talk about is how to do other basic programming stuff we'll go into loops we'll go into conditions and we'll go into functions but after that we'll sort of be going on to building more complicated things with python so Things like actually adding one to each of the elements in here. There are libraries that build on to the basic Python system that make this super easy. And it lets you basically have other data types, uh, another class where when you add them together, it adds, like if we did this, it would allow us to do that because it understands that with this list, we want to treat it like a, a matrix in math and just add 11 to each of the elements here. So that's sort of what we'll build up to to be able to 
handle all of our engineering and mathematical requirements for what we want in a programming language. But uh, for now, we're just going to keep going over the foundational stuff and then we can get up to that point and be solving problems. So hopefully you learned a lot and thanks for watching.